Does a spring pour forth with the same opening, both fresh, fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No one can salt water yield fresh, or no more can salt water feel, yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Reading from Mark, chapter 8. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered them, You're the Messiah. He sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples... He rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. You may be seated. I want to give a special thank you this evening. Uh, normally Saturday night, we don't have anyone in the in the sound room. Occasionally, I've I've joked that uh, that I'm the the sound uh, the sound guy when I've made mistakes <laughs> and go need to run up there to fix them. But but tonight, uh, Jeff Holden is is in there and he's recording the service for Facebook and. And for television, so hello, television listeners. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we also have somebody who's who's running the PowerPoint tonight. Thank you, Madeline Brackey. 
Uh, and I want to put that out also as an opportunity. If any of you would like to learn how to use the sound system and the video system, it's not too tricky. And Jeff and I can show you. <laughs> but uh, these projectors make it really hard for me to surprise you with what I'm going to preach about this evening. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about Psalm 116. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> And now I, I know, I know usually Pastor Craig and I ta talk mostly about the passage that we read from the Gospels, um, but the whole Bible is inspired by God. The whole Bible is useful to teach and encourage us, and the whole Bible points to Jesus. Plus, here's something else. The book of Psalms is the part of the Old Testament that Jesus quotes the most. And throughout the New Testament, when people make references to earlier in the Bible, the most common book they turn to is Psalms. The Psalter is, it's a book of the words to 150 songs. And a lot of them were written by King David, a few were written by other figures we know, and a lot of them are anonymous. The oldest was probably written by Moses about 1,400 years before Jesus, and the newest was probably written when the Jews came back from exile and rebuilt the temple about 400 years before Jesus. So that's a period of 1,000 years that the Psalms were written in. Once when I was in college, uh, I went to an Ethiopian Orthodox church service with a Catholic friend who is very traditional, a guy who generally only wanted to go to Mass in Latin. He made an exception for this church service because he was an Ethiopic. <laughs> and about two hours into the worship service, the style of music started to change, and my friend wanted to leave, so we, so we walked out, and he told me, I don't like this modern music. <laughs> Well, on the screens there in the sanctuary, there was a note of when the songs were written, 1900. <laughs> it was more modern than the other music that, uh, that they'd been singing earlier that was up to 1,000 years old. So I imagine a music snob reading the Psalms and saying something like, well, the Psalms are great, but I don't like their new stuff. <laughs> the Psalms are a sort of hymnal. The Psalms express the full breadth of human feeling. I mean, we, we go to concerts of artists that we like, in part because those artists' songs capture some ways that we feel. And the Psalms do that incredibly well. When you don't know what to say, when you don't have the words to pray, the Psalms have got you covered. And I love that. It reminds me that it's not bad for me to feel sad about how I'm doing. It's not wrong for me to be angry over injustice. And the Psalms remind me that I can turn to God even with my sins, even when I feel the worst about them, that I can bring them to him and repent and he listens. And the Psalms remind me to praise and give glory to God. And that's what this Psalm is. This is a praise song, uh, though it contains elements of other genres too. There's suffering, there's prayer, and for a moment there's anger too. And to give you just a little bit of background, we don't know the background for this psalm. <laughs> we don't know who the author is. Some of the psalms will start out with a note saying who wrote it. This one doesn't. We just know that it's a man since the psalmist, uh, and that's a fancy word for the writer of a psalm. He describes himself as a son. But conveniently for us, the psalm begins with an introduction. It says right in the beginning what the psalm is for and what it is about. Uh, Madeline, can you go to the next slide? It'll show us the beginning of the psalm. There's the beginning of it. I've broken up the passage into five sections, and the first section is great because it shows us what genre this psalm is. It's praise. Now, you might ask yourself, why do you love God? I'm asking you right now, why do you love God? Your parents couldn't make you love God by forcing you to go to church. Your Sunday school teacher couldn't make you love God, so why do you love God? Or I, I'm not going to assume that everyone here is a Christian yet, and if you're visiting and this is new for you, you deserve a good answer to the question, why should you love God? That's what this psalm is about. That's what the psalmist tells us right here. He gives us his answer to that question. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. Because God actually pays attention to me and actually listens. It doesn't mean that God always does everything that I tell him to, 
that's more magic genie than the real God, but God listens to me, especially in the hardest times. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice, because he inclined his ear to me. You know, again, because God pays attention to his prayers and his needs, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. If the Lord is listening to me, then I'm going to keep talking to him. If God will take my call, then I'm always going to call him my whole life long. That's, that's already a remarkable thing. I, I, I want us to all see that, that the God of the universe should take notice of you and me. If I worked for a huge corporation and the CEO gave me his cell phone number and actually talked to me on the phone, well, I'd, I'd be amazed, right? And I'd give him a call whenever I had trouble at work. But the God who is the creator and ruler of all that is and ever has been, for him to take my call, that's extraordinary, right? Why do you love God? I love God, the psalmist says anyway, because God listens. You can go to the next slide. Now, having introduced the song, we get to the bad news. This person has suffered. I think this would have to be set to country music because, well, he says, the snares of death encompassed me. Well, a snare, it's a small trap of rope or cable that catches an animal sort of like a lasso, lasso or a noose. It, it's effective to get rabbits or squirrels, but against a person, it shouldn't be too bad since it's so small. But here the psalmist says that multiple snares have encompassed him. They're all around. Every limb is tied down, and they're not just tripping him up. They're around his waist. Now, I imagine you've felt held back at times. Sometimes there's a trap and you just get tripped up, but sometimes they completely encompass you. These are the snares of death, he says. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. Sheol is a Hebrew word for death or the grave. So I imagine a person caught on snares and then pulled down while ghastly hands of death reach up to seize him. He's, he's feeling pangs in his whole body, but it's, but it's mental too. He, he feels like death is coming for his whole person. I suffered distress and anguish. His body and his mind are, are being assaulted. Now what about you? What have you been through? Or what are you going through right now? Maybe those snares are encompassing you too. This man is completely, totally overwhelmed. He's at the end of his wits, at the end of his strength, at the end of himself. He's, he's dying, it seems. He's at the point of death. Then I called in the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. He prays to God. And maybe he's just praying that God would save his soul even if he loses his life, but he's, he's praying. And will God listen well, this is, this is a cliffhanger for a moment. You can go to the next slide. Because there's a brief interlude here. I think this might have been a refrain in the song or something, or, or a bridge. I don't know exactly what the parts of songs are called. <laughs> but with the psalmist on the point of death, the song steps aside to talk about what God's character is like, leaving us in suspense. What is God like? Well, what do you think? If someone asked you what the God of Jesus Christ is like, how would you answer? Or maybe you've come here today because you're asking that question yourself. What is God like? What is God's character? Gracious is the Lord, says the psalmist. But also God is righteous. He's both kind and just. He takes cruelty seriously, but he lovingly welcomes people in. That's, that's how I think of God being gracious, welcoming people in. You know, gracious is a word that I use just to describe a host. And I'm welcoming this in. <laughs> you know, but God is like someone who's invited you over to their house. God is gracious to welcome us. And gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful, which means there's hope for people who have gotten themselves into trouble. Because this is part of God's fundamental character. He is gracious, righteous, and merciful. And this is what it means in practice. The Lord preserves the simple. 
And you know, simple doesn't, doesn't mean people who are living in tiny houses or people who have decluttered and simplified their lives. No, no, this means someone who is honest, someone who is plain dealing, and maybe someone who is a little bit dumb. One of the ancient translations of this, a version that took it from Hebrew into Greek, wrote this as, the Lord preserves the little children. I think that's an accurate take on what it means. The Lord preserves the little children. And doesn't Jesus tell us that we should be like little children? That's God's character in action. He preserves the simple. And in this man's particular case, and now we get a hint at what happened to him, when the snares of death encompassed him, he says, when I was brought low, he saved me. God saves the lowly. When he was low, God saved him. That's what God does. That's who God is. Next slide, please. So this is the ending to the cliffhanger. This is what happens to the psalmist. We cut back to the action, and he's saying to himself, Return, O my soul, to your rest. And why is he saying that? Because the Lord has dealt bountifully with his soul, with his person. And then we get to the specifics of what God has done. For you have delivered my soul from death. And that makes me think that he might not just have been on the verge of death, but might, like Jonah in the fish's belly, or like Lazarus, or the daughter of Jairus, he might actually have died. But God has delivered him from that. His sadness and anguish are over. God has delivered his eyes from tears. His physical suffering and weakness is over. God has delivered his feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This is what God has done for him. And I want to say to everyone here, any of your loved ones who have passed away, anyone who has died in Christ, this has happened to them too. God delivers from death from tears, from stumbling, to give full life with him forever. For those who have died, this is already complete. They walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And for us, this deliverance is promised, but God has already done everything to make it happen, but it might not be fully, fully realized yet. But I do want to ask you to think about this. What has God done for you? Maybe God has already brought you out of sickness and suffering. And I pray that God has brought you out of self-destructive habits and sin. But I want to add that in Christ, God has guaranteed in faith his salvation to eternal life. What God has done for the psalmist, God has done for you too. And I hope that you've seen part of this, hints, reminders of this, but I know that we will see it more completely realized when Jesus returns. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. This is why we love the Lord. He's promised that. He's, he's done that for us. Even when we're down on ourselves, getting cynical about our condition, getting cynical about other people and human nature, even then we can believe because it's true and because God has delivered us from every evil. You can move to the last slide of this. This is a longer section than the others, and it's not really visible for any of you. <laughs> a little bit too small. But it overlaps and it connects in a couple of topics, so I'm going to draw out and focus on just a couple of sentences from here. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? For all the benefits, for the many, many things that God has done for us, what, what should we do for him? Well, first of all, we can't do as much for God as God has done for us. And second, God doesn't need us to either. So the psalmist says, Instead of promising some gift to God, some repayment, instead he says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Just like in the beginning of the psalm, he says he'll call on the Lord, but here he says he will call on the name of the Lord, that he will publicly say who it is who has saved him. The cup of salvation? Well, you can bet that cup isn't one that he's filled himself. God gives the salvation. We just lift up the cup. He is going to, the psalmist, in worship together like us here, lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And in fact, 
I'm going to do that in a moment when we celebrate the sacrament of communion. And the psalmist is going to, at home with his family, lift up the cup of salvation in praise and in thanking God for his blessing. And almost like a toast, call on the name of the Lord. Like saying grace or giving a toast to God, he'll give glory to God in worship and at home. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? Well, you won't repay God, and God doesn't need you to. Jesus died for us, and we can't repay him that. But he gave it as a free gift, and we aren't supposed to pay him back. So what will you render to the Lord for all his benefits to you? Give him glory. Praise him. Give him the sacrifice, and now he's being figured, as the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Thank God. Keep asking for help. Keep asking for more blessings. Keep naming him as the one who has saved you. Name him, glorify him, lift up a cup, and praise him at home, in church. Praise the Lord. That's our response. That's it. We can make it so complicated for ourselves, but we're already saved from all evil. God is already good. He is gracious to welcome us in. He is righteous against evil, merciful to poor, simple sinners like us. He has saved us. And the only response that makes sense is to love him and to always, everywhere, praise the Lord. Amen. Our song of the day is number 661 in the Red Hymnals. And I believe, yes, the words will not be on the screen, so you've got to grab a, grab a hymnal, unless you already know the words to this one. I invite you to stand as we sing together.
invite us to declare our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Now we gather our tithes and our offerings, and we give certainly not as a repayment to God, but we give as a thanksgiving, for God loves a cheerful giver. we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us. We pray that you would encourage us when we fall into those most difficult times. We pray that when the snares of death encompass us, that we would turn to you in prayer and in faith, knowing that you redeem us from all circumstances, knowing that you lift us up from all depths, and knowing that Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord has been there already. He has gone down to the depths, even to Sheol, to bring us back and to give us life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray to you for our world. We pray that you would teach us how we ought to respond to your grace and your incredible love for us. We pray that your salvation would increase in our lives, transforming us more into the likeness of Jesus and to those around us. We pray that we would share your love and invite others into relationship with you. We pray that you would redeem a broken world and bring peace to conflicts. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that you'd bless and guide those in authority over us, our president, governor, and all members of Congress and judges. We pray that you'd bless and protect those who serve in our nation's armed forces. We pray that you'd bring healing to those who are in need, especially those who are dear to this congregation. 